Welcome to this episode of The Wolf and the Shepherd. Today we're going to talk about the end of the world, or as we affectionately refer to it, come Armageddon come, especially in this kind of trying times that we've been in. Some people are saying either get this over with or come Armageddon come. So are we really even, you know, you and I, are we really even worried about the end of the world? I don't think I've ever sat down and thought, oh, wow, if the world ends, it's going to be terrible. Because if the world ends, uh, I guess if it's long and drawn out, it could be pretty terrible. But Well, yeah, you, you've got a, a world-ending scenario maybe that lasts a few seconds. Maybe, you know, we don't know there's something catastrophic happening until the final few seconds and then boom, or you have something that happens and it just kind of slowly drains the life out of the world. So kind of two different scenarios there. I mean, on the on the one hand, on the quick one, what are you going to do? I mean, it it's going to happen and it's like, oh, you know, and then you're gone. The long one, that one would kind of suck. Yeah. So I've never at any stage in my life, regardless of, you know, some of the scares they've thrown out there, ever worried about the end of the world i guess i didn't really kind of think it through when i was younger like i just said about if it was drawn out because that could be pretty miserable i was thinking more of a you know something which wiped us out you know in the blink of the blink of an eye or something like that because i figure even if it happened tomorrow then oh well i guess one of the things to kind of actually think about is the, the blink of an eye scenario like you're talking about, right? As long as you yeah. know it's not coming, not really a big deal. But right. let's say we knew 321 days from now, in the blink of an eye, we'd be gone. Well, we'd yeah. already hit that counter and say, well, the end of the world's going to be in 321 days. So even if we know in a blink of an eye, yeah. we still look at it as, well, the end of the world's here, and it's going to happen 321 days from now versus right. not knowing. I guess it'd be only worse if you knew in 321 days there was going to be some kind of event that would start the end of the world that was going to last at least 12 years. Right. That would suck even worse. Yeah. Um, so so have, has there ever been a stage in your life, whether because of something which the TV has told you you need to be scared of, or whether your mind has just wandered by itself, have you ever been kind of like worried about the end of the world? I can't say that I have. I, I remember there were several scenarios growing up. I mean, growing up in the middle of the 80s, you know, the Cold War, it's going, you know, and, and there was always that threat of, the nuclear holocaust that you know Russia and the US were going to launch their nukes at each other but quite honestly i think we did more tornado drills than we did any kind of nuclear weapons drills uh, you know you you look back at history with the kids and even you know into the cold war but before that there were all those bomb uh, drills or whatever you know incoming missile drills and things like that and they get under their desks we didn't really do too much of that. So, you know, throughout that time, I never really concerned myself with it. Uh, Y2K, whenever it started coming around, didn't really worry myself too much with that one because I understood what was going on with that, but a lot of people didn't. And the news kind of, you know, frightened you up a little bit about what could happen there. So uh, I, I would consider that my my childhood portion growing up. I never... Never really looked into it all that much. What about you? Um, I think I was always fascinated with the possibility of perhaps an asteroid impact. That seemed, I don't know, on on some level when you're a kid, that actually seems quite a cool way to go. Sure. Um, And don't forget Hollywood made two movies the same year about right. that, right? So, yeah. so you had Armageddon with Bruce Willis, yeah. and then you had uh, Deep Impact with Elijah Wood, and it was, you know, the same movie basically came out, just right. two, two different scenarios a little bit, but they both were able to save the world from annihilation. I wonder what spiked that. I can't remember back at the time if we were supposed to be hit by any kind of comet or asteroid going on. I mean, you understand the... Uh, popularity of pandemic movies at the moment on right. netflix and you know all these b titles kind of rushing uh to on demand it it, it kind of makes you wonder was there something that was coming our way and you know maybe nasa scientists put some high percentage 
you know, they, they always, if you look in the news, they're like, oh, you know, this asteroid the size of the Empire State Building has a point zero one percent chance of hitting us now. Yeah. And that's kind of popular in the news. It seems like every month there's something that has this point zero one percent chance. But what if back then there was something that had like a 10% chance? Right. You're saying, well, you know, 10% chance... That's pretty big when you consider the cosmic shooting gallery that's out there with all the debris and the asteroids and all that stuff that's floating around. Maybe, maybe there was something that they said, you know, hey, we're going to know more in three years based off of it circling around the sun and what the sun does to it. But, you know, our projections are based in this. So they ran out to Hollywood and said, hey, we need a movie to show that, hey, we can defend ourselves against this and and get America all excited, and then next thing you know, that whole idea just faded away. I right. mean, it, it really did. Yeah. That come and went real quick. I think people get tired of end-of-the-world scenarios. You know, Hollywood went through a period where they really ramped up the zombie movies for the first time in a, uh, a few decades. And, you know, a lot of TV shows, you know, The Walking Dead, Fear the Walking Dead, and, you know, a number of others... You know, I've come out with a zombie type. Uh... Zombies, for some reason, got popular. Yeah. You know, it, it wasn't the old zombie movies of the past. It, it become in vogue, right? And, right. And just all of a sudden, that was kind of the popular new yeah. thing. You know, werewolves disappeared. And vampires, well, if you don't count Twilight, you know, vampires kind of came and went. And all, all those things kind of came and went. And then just all of a sudden, zombies got real popular. And... Even today, right now, I mean, they're still making zombie stuff. It's still being produced. Well, zombie is really just a big game of tag. Yeah, Hor- <laughs> horrible game and of ki- tag. And kids yeah. and kids love tags. So, yeah, and, you know. and unlike that uh, competitive tag that they have now, so maybe that's another way to yeah. kind of condition our minds. Say, hey, we've shown you the slow zombies. You right. know, did, now you oh, got the, the fast, fast ones. yeah those world the, war z ones oh, they, they were, were pretty fa- fast that is they? true yeah. that that is yeah. true they were fast yeah now um actually uh should have mentioned earlier this the fear of the end of the world is called called either a doomsday phobia or apocalyptophobia oh. okay um and you know another of uh the names for the apocalypse or the end of the world um it's obviously armageddon and that name actually comes from the book of revelations uh 1616 where it talks about the climatic battle that starts on the mountain of megiddo which is about 55 miles just north of jerusalem yeah a a no kidding real place right i mean this this place is there this isn't some figment it it's not really an event per se like most people think it's actually a place, the War of Megiddo. Right. And, um, you know, you look at the... It's supposed to be, you know, two armies, one on either shore, and the horses of the apocalypse turn up. Uh, the white horse, uh, I think, which is supposed to mean conquest. The red horse, obviously meaning war. The black horse, which was pestilence or famine. And the pale horse, meaning death. Now, you know, there are a lot of evangelical Christians who take the book of revelations very very literally sure but then you have a lot of um theologian scholars who you know probably spend a little bit more time you know reading into the um symbolism symbolism. yeah the symbolism and not taking not taking the words literally who you know still can't really come to a common consensus about what large portions of the book of revelations mean especially in regards to the end time prophecy i mean you know with evangelical christians a lot of the time they regard it as the end times or and to look for the signs of the end of the age and they tend to be pretty fanatical about you know the rise of the antichrist and the mark of the beast you know worrying about all these biochips in your hand or or the the old you know is is it 666 and in all that good stuff uh i think you know, th- this is one of these things that we've, you know, incredibly fact-checked, right? Yep. But Revelation, from what I've always understood, is the most studied book of the Bible and the most, you know, mold over and, 
you know, no, no one can really quite give you a nice, succinct, hey, here's what this book is saying. Most of the other ones, they're saying, oh, you know, written by this dude at this time, he was doing this, and this is what this means, blah, blah, blah. But Revelation, for some reason, there's all this question marks, all these folks out here saying, well, here's my interpretation. Well, no, here's my interpretation. And it's kind of the, the one book of the Bible there that's kind of floating out there that nobody seems to quite agree exactly what it's trying to tell us. Right. And... I think people have been, at least with the evangelical Christians, people have been saying, oh, it's the end times for, you know, 70 or 80 years. And I don't know how long that period of, you know, tribulation or how long that end time period is supposed to go on for, you know, in, until Christ returns. So I think any time, you know, uh, I think it's a bit of a cliche. Uh, you use it on movies of those old guys in busy city streets holding the signs up saying uh, the end is nigh. Yeah. But d don't you think, it, and it's of course kind of hard to, to look back historically and figure this out, but don't you think that just about every generation of people probably say to themselves, we got to be living in the end times. Oh, I yeah. mean, it, yeah. you, you see technological advances, you see diseases, you see pandemics, you see wars or brinks of huge wars. And so every generation is probably sitting there, you know, sitting there to themselves saying, oh, we got to be in the end times. This is it. This is the last generation. I'm going to see the end of the world before I die. Yeah, I think pretty much every generation has agreed or been sorry, agreed on either side of the argument, this is the best time to be alive, this is the worst time to be alive. And I think it was uh, Joe Rogan who really kind of uh, doubles down on people who say, oh, this is the worst time to be alive ever. He's always like, no, dummy, this is the best time ever to be alive. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think about just watching a movie in, like, let's say, set in the cowboy times, right? Right. And you you think to yourself, oh, you know, that, that really kind of looks cool. You know, everybody's wearing a gun on their hip, and, you know, they're getting in these saloon fights, and they're taking, you know, everything out to the street, meeting at high noon, and, and having shootouts in the street and all this. But then I get to thinking, yeah, but you know what? They don't bathe every day. They don't have all this running water. They don't have refrigeration. They don't have cars. Uh, Back to the Future 3 actually is one of those movies that kind of puts it into perspective. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, Doc Brown ends up being a blacksmith in the Old West, but what does he do? He invents a refrigerator so he can have iced tea. You right. know, it, he realizes that the modern conveniences that we get used to is all our way of life. Kind of like uh, the COVID-19 pan demic in in the panic behind toilet paper you look back and you realize that toilet paper has only been around for less than 200 years right and so if, if you were kind of pre-civil war in america days there was no toilet paper so you see some of that you know oh it might have been nice living in this era and dressing like this and doing this but then you think but there was no toilet paper I mean, right. that, that, I'm sorry that I'm I'm out when it comes to that. I'm just I'm out. Yeah, I mean, that, I think that's why there's uh, the success of so many role playing games. It's like you can be a cowboy, maybe play Red Dead Redemption yeah. for you know a couple of hours, but that's enough. Then you need to go. Yeah, there. <laughs> absolutely. Well, the whole time you're sitting in your air conditioned house, and you know you're you're drinking a, a cold beverage while you're playing the game, and and you hit pause so you can go up and use the bathroom and use the toilet paper that's sitting there in your bathroom. And then you come back and then you get to pretend to be a cowboy. Right. I mean, it makes total sense. Yeah. But the one of the more recent, not, not of course, this whole COVID-19 thing we're in right now, but one that I you know, distinctly remember was the whole 2012 thing and coming right up to 2012 and... and what I guess could be considered the misinterpretation of the Mayan calendar. Right. Uh, that, that's the last one that really kind of sticks out to me, other than, of course, the one we're in right now, right? But, but the 2012 Mayan calendar, I mean, there, there was the 2012 movie where they talk about, you know, the, the world starting to fall apart, if I remember right, and all that. So th that was another one of those end-of-the-world scenarios. Yeah, the... Um... You mentioned 
um, well, you said the word misinterpretation. I mean, it was a pretty uh, bad misrepresentation because there is actually, there's no end to the Mayan calendar. So all this stuff about, oh, the calendar ends on blah, 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 was an outright lie to begin with. Right. It, it was more of an odometer thing. Right, yeah. You know, the old school cars, you know, I've got a really old Pontiac, and it only has five digits on an analog odometer. Right. And once it went over 100,000 miles and went all back to zero, yeah. that doesn't mean it has zero miles on right. it. It just means the odometer rolled over, and yeah. that's what the Mayan calendar was. Yeah. It's like, here's the odometer, and once we get to here, then we start over. Yeah. Yeah, and with the again with the going back to the Mayans, they actually don't have any end time prophecy, and so I mean the whole thing was a complete lie to begin with. But it was just amazing how, you know, it's another one of those examples of early fake news where right. it really, you know, it's the news stations that propagated it, and they did a poll in uh, early two thousand twelve. And um, one in seven people worldwide believe the end of the world would come in their lifetime. One in seven. Wow. Yeah. I, I would honestly think it'd be higher than that. I mean, to, to be honest with you. And kind of going back to what I was saying before, that I think a lot of people feel like in their lifetime they're going to see the end of the world. And what that end of the world is to you know several people is among their interpretation. Uh, but one in seven actually, to me, seems kind of low. Well, I figured, you know, if you do have that apocalyptic phobia, you know, the fear of the end of the world, that probably emotions overtake logic, because if you look at all of the different end-of-the-world scenarios, and we're going to talk about a few of those later, that when you take statistically the chance of those things happening... And we can measure those somewhat empirically based upon how many times they've happened in the past and the effect they've had. That, you know, people who have a fear of the end of the world, they might be correct, but the chances of it coming in their lifetime, you know, is so small that, you know, they probably need to worry more about being killed by a fallen piano coming out of the window. Yeah, kind of like the, the whole deal where there's more people killed by cows than there are sharks. Right. Everybody's afraid of sharks for yeah. some reason, but cows kill more people than sharks right. do every year. Yeah. So kind of that same thing. And and I could see if you take somebody that maybe has that more of a fear of death, and even in this one you're talking about the fear of the end of the world, but I think some of that is encompassing the fear of death. I remember there was an old Seinfeld stand-up where he said that uh, the number two fear from most people is death, and the number one fear is public speaking. Right. So by that line of logic, you would rather be in the casket than doing the eulogy. Right. And makes perfect sense because sure. most people, of course, they're they're afraid of talking in public. So let's scratch all those. And then second of all, most people are afraid of death because most people, and I, I think it's easy to argue that none of us, no matter what your religious beliefs are, none of us knows exactly what happens right. after we die because there's been nobody to come back and say, hey, this is what happens. You know, we, we, we don't have a full explanation. So could actually be chalked up to fear the unknown and probably a big correlation behind that. Uh, the fear of the end of the world, fear of death is more along the lines of fear of the unknown because nobody is 100% sure exactly what happens right now i remember earlier you mentioned uh i think when you were back in school seeing the propaganda movies to you know what to do you know in case of a nuclear attack right now we never actually had any drills in our school uh really? during that cold war time um but that well I, growing up back there in england did you, did they ever say there were nukes pointed at y'all? Oh, yeah. Or, or yeah. Th it was just, oh, we're just going to go on about our business. If they come, they come. And if yeah. they don't, they don't. And we're well, not going to waste you our have time. To, well, you have to remember, you know, how many USSF uh, bases there are in England, for one, mm -hmm. which would be a big target. Sure. And as, you know, America's greatest ally at the time, that, you know, no, no way would they let us be a communications you know, go between, between, you know, the United States and Europe. Makes sense. You know, we'd have been wiped out. I mean, I know we've had um, 
nuclear weapons on our soil and also we were a nuclear power at the time so we would be pretty much an instant target along along with the states right but again we never had any of those training videos and i do remember seeing one on tv where the kids were supposed to duck near the closest wall and stick a textbook over their head Oh, well, that's going to save you from nuclear annihilation. And, you know, maybe if it's a history book, maybe not a pamphlet on, you know, great sports figures of the 1960s. But, you know, how is that textbook really going to protect you from all the radiation and the, the nuclear fallout that comes from behind that? Well, actually, the biggest risk, I think, from using that method to protect yourself from, you know, nuclear blast is possibly the chances of uh, either starving to death or dying of dehydration because surely you know going through all the things you've mentioned and how long it takes you know the radioactive dust to settle they're going to have to be there for days with that book over the head because i mean when it is when is it safe then to take the book off your head true yeah and then think about how tired your arms are going to get holding oh, that yeah. book over your head well no i mean if you're that smart i mean you know, you can just balance the book on your head, especially as you're just lounging against the wall. Yeah, well, that's true. Of yeah. course, if, if you're really smart, you realize this is stupid for me to have a book over my right. head. <laughs> so I feel bad for little Timmy in the corner that's holding the book right. over his head for three days, and then he finally dies right. because he's died of dehydration and starvation and, you know, didn't even have the chance for the nuclear fallout to get to him and right. the, the radiation and everything because he was sitting there holding the book over his head and he forgot to drink anything or eat anything. Right. Now, I was still in England when the Y2K bug, all the hysteria surrounding it, um, came about. Over here, was it something which was like on a day-to-day -day basis? Oh, absolutely. During during 1999, that that's what everything was all about preparing for the y2k bug you know and all it was was an odometer thing kind of like yeah. we looked at the mayan calendar and they mm -hmm. said well everything that was programmed only has two digits for the year and so everybody was freaked out about it you could go to the computer stores and buy the patches and you know it was kind of hard to find those for a while to put the y2k patch on your computer i do remember uh, getting close to New Year's Eve where they said, whatever you do at midnight, do not pick up the phone because they were afraid if everybody picked up the phone to see if the phones worked at midnight that all the phone lines would shut down. So I, I do vividly remember that. They said, do not pick up the phone at midnight because they were afraid if everybody picked up their phones, it would shut down the phone networks. And, you know, there was a lot of things about bills being late or, or the water not working because the computers that ran the water facilities were not going to be able to calculate things correctly. And so they would think that everybody's bill was 100 years overdue and would start shutting water off and electricity off and all that crazy stuff. And then here we go, January 1, 2000, complete non-event. Right. Just absolutely nothing happened. And I remember going to the stores, you know, a few days after that, and you'd walk by the racks and racks of the Y2K patches on the CDs and everything. Yeah. And it was just a giant joke. You know, it, yeah. nothing happened. We just all moved on. Yeah. One thing I don't understand, and with you and I both having a history in coding to a certain degree, is why at, the, at that time the programmers didn't take something, you know, pretty basic electronically take um all of the information off the chip replicate it or emulate it and then just run through and then see what it, that device would do you know that one second after midnight yeah. i don't understand why it, it never occurred to anybody look just run a simulation based upon the code you know for a hundred percent is in this chip and if the device continues to work in this emulated environment then surely that proves okay these calculators or whatever it is this refrigerator or whatever is not going to turn off right great question i have no idea you you would hope at some level some people did i i do remember at this time going back that uh and of course at this time i'm in college i do remember one of my college professors being worried about it not for us 
but for Russia, thinking that they had such antiquated technology, antiquated code, things like that, that the computers would think that something had happened to Russia and would automatically launch their nuclear right. weapons at mm -hmm. us. And so, I, I mean, you go down, it's a laundry list of things that people were worried about that. But when it came and went, once again, it came and went and nothing happened. Yeah. Now, I guess the latest thing where at least everybody is pretty much focused on at the moment is our so-called pandemic of uh, COVID-19 coronavirus. Uh, now, I've already had it. And I felt a bit bad for a day and a half. You've obviously had it, given yeah. as often as we hang out. And, you know, you yeah, said you one, maybe had one day where you felt a bit crappy. I, I want to say probably a day, day and a half is what I felt as yeah. well. Yeah. And so most of the people I've been around, you know, must have got it from me at some point, whether it be my son, my son's mother, uh, pe people I've worked with uh, during that period of time. So... I still at this point don't know anybody who's died from it. Now, having said that, I'm just saying that just as an example of it's not a case when they try and f push this fear mongering that, oh, everybody knows people who have died of corona and stuff. It's simply not true. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think with it recently coming out that out of, you know, 100 deaths mm -hmm. attributed to coronavirus, actually only six of them are actually due to the virus itself the rest comes from underlying secondary tertiary conditions whereby any virus which, yeah you know. which would have uh, uh, triggered the immune system like that would likely have resulted in death anyway and so that was six out of a hundred so if you reduce all the deaths we have had so far from it and only take six percent of those actually being from the coronavirus then you're looking at something which is not even, you know, 10% as lethal as every flu we've had for sure. the last 50 years. And so uh, I'm not trying to downplay it. I know there are people dying of it. I know there are people in hospital with it. And, you know, depending on, you know, your physiological condition, that, you know, it can be very, very dangerous, especially for old people. So I'm not certainly not downplaying the virus. I'm just saying that, given what the flu has done every year for the last 50 years, trying to paint COVID-19 as the end of the world, you know, is a bit of an overreach. Oh, I, I totally agree. And what, one of the big differences, I think, with uh, the COVID-19 that's going on right now versus, let's say, the flu or any of those others is the hype behind it that you can be a carrier of it and not show any symptoms, where, you know, most people, they get the flu... They know they got the flu. Right. They're immediately showing the symptoms and everything. So they say to themselves, oh, I got the flu, or, or maybe they just think they have a cold or something like that. So they stay home, they stay away. Where, you know, this one is, well, nobody really knows how long it takes to, you know, once you have it, how long you could carry it without showing symptoms. So kind of have everybody on their toes. Kind of the same thing behind the Y2K. Nobody knows what it's going to happen on you know, December 31st at 11.59, and you sit there and you watch that clock and what happens at midnight. So it's kind of that same thing. So it plays very, very well into an end-of-the-world scenario. I mean, you and I both, like we said, we we're, you know for 100% certainty you've had it. I haven't been tested, but I'm 98% certain I've had it. But it's not really changing the way that I'm doing anything. But there's a very good chance that... Maybe we're not immune, and we end up getting it again because it hadn't been around long enough to even know that. So, yeah, I mean, there, there's all kinds of things up in arms. But a, a coronavirus, you know, which is what COVID-19 is, those have been around for a while. This is a new one. But there's all kinds of other scenarios that people have worried about for either just the past few decades or maybe even for the past few centuries about what could cause the end of the world. Yeah, and, uh, you know, pretty much every civilization in human history has had its own, you know, end-of-the-world prophecies. And, you know, just, just a short list here, okay? I mean, obviously, you know, we know the um, predominant Christian one. Sure. You know, 
Um, well, and and before we say we know that, of course, you and I know that, but you know, you, you do have the Christian version. Yeah. So mm-hmm. let, let's just kind of preface yeah. it that way. So you, so you do have the, we'll call it the biblical, the, yeah. the Christian mm-hmm. version of what's going to happen at the end yeah. of the world. Yeah. And, and you have the Aztecs who probably have one of the more sensible sounding ones, even though logistically I don't know how this would occur, but they believe that the world uh, will end by a never-ending solar eclipse. Now, if that means the blackening out of the sky... That could happen, obviously, on a lot of different scenarios, whether it be a super volcano erupting, right? you know, nuclear war and yep. fallout blocking it out. So, I mean, that one kind of, it, you can kind of see, has a little bit of sense about it. Yep. Um, now, the Hindus have no end of the world prophecy whatsoever, just like the Mayans didn't, but right. were p- purported to have. Um, but my absolute favorite uh, was the Hopi or Hopi. Uh, Native yeah. American tribe, they said the end of the world, the earth will be covered with iron snakes, stone rivers, and a giant spider's web. Hmm. But again, if those are metaphors, then that one might actually be quite clever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you think about like iron snakes that could be interpreted as you know soldiers and weapons, right? Uh, the giant spider web, maybe that's kind of your your nuclear fallout, your nuclear clouds, something like that. Stone rivers could be, you know, big navy ships just, you know, constantly in all the water. So, it, actually kind of an interesting take. I mean, if this were the Mythbusters, you could maybe call that one plausible. Right. Now... As we mentioned earlier, in 2012, when they did that study prior to the predictive um, Mayan end of the world scenario, uh, one in seven people said they had a fear of the end of the world coming. Now, we had a look at maybe about 25 to 30 different scenarios. Uh, Some of them were a bit too boring to bring up on the podcast. Yeah. I got bored reading them. Yeah, they were quite... There yeah. were quite a few of them that were very boring. There, there were two of them I skipped just on the title alone. I, yeah. and I didn't. Under, I didn't even understand the title, but I couldn't even. I was that bored by the time I'd read yeah. the title. I couldn't be bothered to read what the description of it is, and you it could and have been both. something really cool. Yeah, <laughs> but th- that goes back to our uh, exquisite journalistic fact-checking methods that we go through to prepare this show. Yeah, I know. I think it, I think what's going to happen eventually is that we bypass so much knowledge which could have disproved what we're saying <laughs> yeah we you know we're we gonna probably, have a cult, a cult of disinformative yeah uh, we could have already disproved each other and, <laughs> and we can't even remember what we said 20 minutes ago right yeah i it, i think it's quite hard for some of our listeners to believe that we're not actually scientists well maybe we are scientists yeah but just but we'll disprove topic with yeah reached, but so well yeah, in about five minutes we'll probably prove that we're not scientists right but so it, let's go over some of the ones that we kind of found that quote unquote interesting as far as end of the world um, possibilities. Yeah. Okay. Um, the first one, and I know we don't normally talk about controversial subjects on the show, was uh, climate change. Now, this doesn't relate to the whole argument about man-made or man acting as a catalyst for climate change. This is specifically talking about natural cycles sure. across the well, and, Earth's and history. Let's be honest. I mean, that, that's been proven. If you want to call it an end-of-the-world scenario, you look at the Ice yeah. Ages, right? Yeah. And, and you could say if all life exists or yeah. ceases to exist, that could be considered an end-of-the-world scenario. So an Ice Age is a change in the climate. Therefore, I mean... We could have another ice age, which would be an end of the world scenario. Right. And NASA actually said that in the last 650,000 years, there's been seven full cycles of glacier advance and retreat. And the last ice age ended about 7,000 years ago. So we've obviously got a bit of a bit of a ways to go before the next one. But do you not find it arrogant? And again, not really trying to throw the whole you know, man's influence right. on the uh, climate out there. But do you not find it a bit arrogant and short-sighted sometimes that p- 
people just cite studies, the number of studies, the professors, the universities, without actually, again, ever reading what it says in, st in terms of the statistics, such as the possibility of this happening is, again, super, super small, right. you know, percentage. And yet people automatically just think man is so powerful we can bring forward, you know. Well, I, I think you hit the nail on the head with the term arrogance, right? Because uh, our scientific community, as great as they are, have made several advancements over the past, you know, what, five, ten years versus the last 50, versus the last 100, versus the last 500 years. Science has grown by leaps and bounds. And so all of this science that we have collected, we have all these guys that are out there that know all this stuff that most people don't really want to learn, don't want to dig into, don't want to understand. They want that smart dude over there that yeah. they cheated off of in you know, high school in physics class, cheated off him so they could pass physics class and go on and just have a regular job. These are the guys that are out there that's, you know, saying, hey, you know, here's this probability of this. And who wants to read a big, thick 200, 300 page paper on the probability of this if it's summarized up in three sentences that there's a good chance the world's going to freeze over in 10 years if we don't do something? You say, whoa, hang on a second. Right. Yeah, you know, we got these big egghead scientists over here telling us that the world's going to you know, literally freeze over in 10 years if we don't do something. Hey, guys, we, we better get out there and we better do something. we got to trust these scientists, guys. And the scientists are saying, well, you know, I don't really get paid enough to defend this, and it took me forever to type out this paper. So you know what? You guys have fun with this. I'm studying my next thing. Right. And uh, I remember, um, well, the earliest climate change threat, I remember actually it was, uh, I think, the ozone layer you know, the depletion of the ozone layer if we didn't right. s start using those uh, carbon fluorides, you know, in, in aerosols and right. old we refrigerators gotta, we, and we stuff. we got to stop using hairspray yeah. because that's going to deplete the ozone layer. Yeah. And I, oh, I I do remember that. And then all of a sudden, all the hairspray cans had the little stickers on them yeah, that said, hey, CFC this, free this, or this doesn't yeah. have any CFC. Yeah. But I can't remember if it came before or after, but the big one over here for a while was acid rain. Oh, right, yeah, you yeah. You know, it was, uh, we're going to have acid rain. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you don't hear about acid rain anymore. Right. And I remember there there were certain people that didn't want to be outside if it was raining because they were afraid that it could be acid rain. Yeah. And that just all of a sudden disappeared. It's like, well, wait, what happened to the acid rain? I mean, that that was kind of one of those as a kid. You think, gosh, could you imagine looking out your window and there's somebody standing out there on the sidewalk and then being rained on <laughs> them and they're them. melting? <laughs> you know, like the the witch of the West when she yeah. gets the water poured on her. It's like, ooh, acid rain. Yeah. And now you don't hear anything about acid rain. But you have to remember, again, the media love the sensationalism, calling something acid rain, where if you actually called it by its true name, a slight pH balance towards an acidic base, you know, it wasn't going to... Just didn't roll off yeah, the tongue. Yeah, but it's the same thing, you know, <laughs> I mean, recently, earlier this year, maybe about two, three months ago, we were promised an invasion of murder hornets. Oh, that's right, yeah. the murder hornets. Yeah, so, right. get, so not only um, giving the hornets a chance to practice men's rear mind to murder and given it even more anthropomorphic qualities, that of but, existentialism, that it's actually going to commit murder. These hornets are over here with one thing on their mind, murder. Murder. But could that have been the guy calling the numbers or, or the scenarios for Apocalypse Bingo, just pulling out yeah. the wrong thing? Like, yeah. you, you know, you, you ever played a game where you, you have to draw a card, like, say, in Monopoly, and you're grabbing the community yeah. chest, and you grab two cards, and you kind of read one, but you glance at the other one, and you put it back so you know what that one is? Did he maybe just grab two cards, and Murder Hornets was one of the cards, and now he just kind of buried it, you know, in the middle of the deck, and maybe in three or four months the Murder Hornets come back? Well, do you remember? Well, no, you wouldn't have remembered because I don't think you were born. And I, and this was before I was born, I think, that the threat of killer bees 
coming up through oh, no, from Brazil no. up through Killer Bees North wasn't America. that long ago. No, I remember and those. Yeah. Us, yeah. yeah, that that was going to come up here too. Yeah. There's always those insects. I mean, even if you look back in the Bible, that was some of the plagues yeah. in Egypt and everything. So insects are always one of those popular things that come along. But yeah, the murder hornets. That one was kind of disappointing. I, I kind of wanted to see one of those. Uh, and, and the fact that we never did really get that onslaught of murder hornets. A little bit disappointing, got to admit. But, hey, you know, stay tuned. Maybe that's coming in the next couple of months. Well, I think um, I, I have a preference of a list of uh, insects, which I, I think would be allowable to kill me. Now, the murder hornet is pretty top of the list. Just simply because if you only need to be stung once and you pretty much go true, you know, in into a coma there and then and die shortly after, that's all right. Now the killer bees thing freaked me out a little bit because yeah, I think it, you have to have, have a minimum number. I don't know whether it's like twelve or eighteen stings for it to be over toxic to the average person. So I'm figuring. That might be a little yeah. bit pain and suffering. That one wouldn't be as good. One, I'm guessing, you know, if you're allergic to bees, yeah. maybe, you know, one of those killer bees does you in like a murder hornet would yeah. do in a normal person. But, yeah, d don't give me something that's got to get me 18, 19 times. I I'd right. rather take one yeah. shot from the murder hornet, you know, kind of like one snake bite from a highly venomous snake yeah. rather than... You know, maybe a rattlesnake that it you know, kind of breaks our insect list. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I totally get that. Totally yeah. get that. Now, my worst one is ants. Oh, absolutely. Because especially the smaller ones, because you'd need bitten you'd need so many so times. So many of them. Yeah, that that would be an absolute painful way to go. It wouldn't be like what were those deals in the mummy movies? You know, those beetles that oh would yeah crawl in, into the skin and kind of devour yeah, you. Yeah, and yeah. Of course. Based off the way the movie was, that kind of looked painful, right. but the guy didn't really last all that long. But right. then when they had the swarm of them, it took somebody out within seconds. Right. So I guess if you were going to get swarmed by one, that wouldn't be so bad if you went, you know, pretty quick. But yeah. I still got to agree with you. One sting from a murder hornet and you're gone. Yeah. If you're going to get hit yeah. by an insect, probably yeah. the way to go. Yeah. Now, maybe... As usual, I probably should have done a little more research on this. Because oh, I it, think we highly researched because, this topic. Because I think, like with a murder hornet, we'll probably go on Google straight after the show ends, read how long it takes to die, and it'll probably say something like, takes a minimum of 72 hours of excruciating oh, pain yeah. and blah, blah, blah. But, and that's just because we didn't look at the list. That one might suddenly <laughs> drop down to number three. Well, it, I don't know what would be worse, that, or that we met to sit and record this, and while we're recording it, then they report on the news that the influx of murder hornets have <laughs> hit. And because we are not looking at the internet yeah. or anything right now, we go ahead and we pack up and we shut the microphones off and we walk outside and we get hit by murder hornets and we look at each other and say, oh, I guess this is how we go. Yeah. And we called murder hornets. So, all right. Yeah. That's going to call into play my knife fighting skills because that's all I have upon my person in, yeah. in terms of weapons. So I'd have to be doing some uh, slicing with and that. dicing with yeah. that. Keep I, those away. I don't think you've got enough ninja skills to kill right. the yeah. murder hornets with a knife. Right. Now, we did talk, um, well, we touched upon uh, nuclear war earlier. And, you know, during the Cold War period especially, I think that was 1947 and was declared kind of over about 1991. Well, um, I think in, in the United States, we kind of officially declared the Cold War over with with the fall of the Berlin Wall. Sure, yeah, yeah. And, you know, at that time, the the big phrase to scare people was, you know, MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. Right. And that, at the time, was the media's way to hype you up and give you anxiety and panic attacks because you're worried about this imminent World War Three. Right. And, and with that mutually aided destruction, uh, there was nowhere to go. You know, it, they're basically saying, hey, if this happens, there, there is no safe spot for you to be in. Right. It, it's going to destroy everything. It's yeah. not like, hey, if you want to live, go move to Greenland and you'll be safe there. There, right. there was no safe spot to be. It was, yeah. that, that was going to be it. They were going to launch enough nukes to knock everything out. Right. And that's the way we were always taught. Yeah. Now, I had a funny thought earlier um, when I was researching this. Do you remember, um, in England it was called the 
Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, CND. And it actually had a decent amount of following because I think towards the end of the Cold War, especially, people were getting tired of having lived, you know, decades in fear of this right. apparently inevitable nuclear war. It was coming, you just didn't know what day it was coming. That, you know, dur- during that period, you know, when when the TV told you you had something to be scared of, you believed that you had something to be scared of. Yeah, I mean, right? why why would the TV lie to you? Why yeah. why would the news lie to you? They're they're trying to help you. They're trying to provide you information. So, yeah, if they say this is what's going to happen, they don't know when, but yeah. this is what's going to happen. Right. You believed them, right? Yeah, and you know, I think now there's actually a far greater threat of a nuclear war, or at least somebody initiating. A nuclear war which expands you know globally uh you know when you have rogue nations such as north korea and iran and them constantly throwing out threats that you know they're going to wipe out the united states they're going to wipe out israel they're going to wipe out here and there that you know during the during the cold war period you know you had one whole country against another whole country which was the biggest threat and then you had a small number of other nations which had nuclear capabilities such as the united kingdom germany right. um well the east side sorry west side of germany um and i never i never felt like i mean obviously you weren't very old i wasn't very old i never felt like there was a threat of war i never did either and looking back on it it, it never was anything that really concerned me because toward, towards the end of the Cold War, it, you started seeing the relationship between the U.S. and Russia lighten up a little bit. Yeah. And it could be all because of Rocky IV. I mean, right. you think about Rocky IV, and, and that was kind of the war between the U.S. and Russia. And even at the end of that, it's kind of, you know, everybody in Russia is chanting Rocky, Rocky. You sure you don't mean... Um, uh, Rocky Three with no. the, Ivan Drago, whatever his name is. No, that was Russian Rocky Four. Oh, Rocky was that, oh, four? Was that yeah. four? Yeah, yeah, I can't remember. yeah. Rocky One is is when he fought Apollo yeah. and lost. Rocky Two, he fights Apollo and again wins. and wins. Rocky Three is when he fights Mister T. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah then yeah. Rocky Four is, oh, yeah, is yeah, Drago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Drago. I know my Rocky movies. Right. I know yeah. my Rocky movies. It's amazing how much propaganda was out there at the time. In, in movies, some of it was quite thinly veiled and others, you know, like the Rocky movies. Right. You know, Top Gun was yeah, the same Top way. Yeah. I mean, it, it, those were Russian MiGs that they were fighting. And, right. you know, they have the dog fight over there and the rest of them bug out and, and all that good stuff. And, of course, America wins. And yeah. we stave off a war because they were closing in on right. the aircraft carrier. And yeah. all of those crazy movies, you know, was it creative hollywood or was it organized propaganda well, i mean we could probably do a whole podcast about the the whole cold war or nuclear annihilation but what what's our next topic about how the world could end uh well here's one which is likely as in it's definitely going to happen at some time and this is a uh, super volcanoes oh yeah kind of like the yellowstone deal like yellowstone now i think the one in pompeii is the actually the most dangerous volcano in the world in terms of where it's located and a super eruption of right. um of mount vesuvius yeah it's the one which yeah pompeii yeah. well pompeii everybody everybody yeah. thinks of the yeah. city of pompeii mm-hmm. that was covered in the ash yeah. and people are even studying it to this day so, so yeah yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. with you. So, I mean, a super volcano is going to happen. Yellowstone um, really erupts. The last eruption was 640,000 years ago. And, and, so, and isn't it long overdue? Based off of, I, I swear I read something that it's overdue for an eruption. There seems to be some shift in parameters ah. uh, with that because although they've averaged out, they can work out, you know, on average every so often how you know, it goes off. There's actually gaps between them which are very wide in variance. So it might have gone like 1.2 million years without erupting, but then erupted twice in 30,000 years. So... 
Well, so it's kind of like, you know, getting an argument with the wife. I mean, you can argue with her once a day for a week, and that just sounds terrible. Then all of a sudden you go two weeks and you have no argument, everything's great, and then yeah. all of a sudden you have one big blow-up argument because yeah. all that stress and everything yeah. gets built up, and then boom, there's a big explosion. Right. So, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it, it's nature, right? It, yeah. That, that makes total sense. Yeah, I mean, and then it's sort of greed... Um, figure by world guard scientists that if Yellowstone goes that it's going to be minimum of 5 billion casualties worldwide and oh, that wow. doesn't obviously that doesn't mean immediately sure it means across you know with the sky being blacked out and some places being too cold or so once again going back to our whole thing about some people are going to die instantly, but then there's going to be some things that's going to take a while to, you know, annihilate people. So you're probably better off being close to it. So you're one of the first ones to go rather than starving to death in 60, 90 days, you know, trying to survive when the sky is black and all that. And right. Vegetation starts dying and animals start dying off, all that good stuff. Yeah. You know, your, your typical domino effect. Right. Um, okay. Now the one, obviously, which we need to address is plague or pandemic. Sure. Yeah. But, you know, to put things into perspective, you know, plagues, pandemics, they've been around uh, actually thousands of years BC. Right. But, you know, I made a list of the most prominent ones, you know, since around um, we got into... Uh, Kind of actually kind of record. written symbolization. Yeah, well, I mean, more of a written and accurate record. Gotcha. Some some of the plagues, you know, go, which you go back, you know, in BC. Okay. The estimates are so wide that it might be one of those COVID things where oh, you fell out of a plane and your parachute didn't open. Oh, you had COVID in your system, so you died of COVID. So right, you don't know at that time because you know if you died, you died whether just in that kind of census count, the people who were responsible for totting up the number of fatalities during the plague yeah. just listed down everything well, as that it, plague. If you go back to it, it's the, the same thought process behind where the term lunatic came from because they said some people that would get out there in the full moon and have too much moonlight shine on them made them crazy. Yeah, and that's where they that. become lunatics. Yeah. So. All right, so let's let's go through some of these uh, you know old school plagues slash yeah. pandemics that have happened. Yeah. Throughout throughout uh, history, and well, of the, course, these are yeah. like you say, kind of plus and minus on yeah. the years and all that. Well, I like I said, the ones I've chosen here are the ones which seem more verifiable, and so the earliest one I could find, which seemed to have any degree of accuracy, was in a uh, 430 BC, the plague of Athens, and it killed a hundred thousand people. Now it wow. was actually pretty localized, so I know a hundred thousand doesn't sound like a lot on a worldwide. You know, scale. Yeah, but if you think about the world population back then, I mean, that's that's pretty big. I mean, right. you, you, you got 100,000 people that die from something. It's going to be newsworthy. Yeah. Uh-huh. Now, the period, um, and this is actually quite a long-lasting plague. Normally, plagues burn themselves out between about six, eight years maximum, depending on how virulent kind, they are. Kind of basically, they run their course and, right. and die off. Yep. Yeah. So there was a plague between 165 and 180 AD. Um, again, from various sources, it seemed to be a, a pretty decent estimate of deaths, and that was actually 5 million. So you look at wow. then going back to that period of time, that's you know, huge. the population, that's a huge hit. Now, that's a big number. Yeah. I mean, especially if we're talking about just you know the turn of the, the new age and Wow, I mean, 5 million people. Yeah, that's yeah, a lot. That is a lot of people. Now, the undisputed champion of the world so far is the Black Death. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And you know that's where the Ring of Ring of Roses. Yeah, Ring, ring around, around the Rosie. Yeah, Ring Around the Well, yeah, yeah we call it Ring of Ring of Roses. Really? I think so. Oh, no. Over, over I might here, be, I might be wrong. Around. It's been a long yeah. time. Since, so, yeah. <laughs> oh, come on. We sang Sorry. that song just yeah. before we started recording. Yeah. But, um, yeah, a lot of people make that song, I think they make it about kind of like boyfriend, girlfriend or some type of romantic oh, yeah. thing when oh, the whole song's cheery. about, the whole song's about, you know, the rash which used to appear on your skin was like a ring of roses, the tissue, a tissue meant you were yeah. coming down with the symptoms and we all fall down means we all die. Yeah. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But so, yeah, I, I, that was from the Black Plague. Yeah. Now the uh, the Black 
uh, Black Death uh, or Bubonic Plague, not the Black Plague. Well, I, yeah. I, I think some people called it the Black Plague, the Black Death, the Bubonic Plague. I mean, there's all kinds of names for it. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that was between 1346, 1353, which at that point you have to think, well, the world's population is kind of building up. But sure. it's, now this is a very wide variance because, again, there were so many bodies and a lot of them were burnt before, you know, they could be counted that the estimates of number of deaths, you know, due to bubonic plague and black death was between 75 million and 200 million, mm -hmm. which was half of Europe at that oh. time. Well, let's also remember back then they weren't filling out death certificates. You know, they, they weren't taking people to the hospital per se. They, they might have had a, a doctor that's walking around, but they're not keeping all that great of records as yeah. far as how many people are dropping dead from this. So, right. I, you know, you buy the fact that that estimate's got to be that wide because yeah. there's really no way of knowing. Yeah. Now, the last one, um, which I want to mention, is uh, the Spanish flu. Well, it's called the Spanish flu, even though it didn't originate in Spain. Um, right. This uh, occurred between 1918 and 1920, which, as you know, we were in middle of World War One at that particular time. And, and, and how convenient that that was about 100 years ago. Right. And it's estimated that 100 million people died of the Spanish flu. But if you think about the situation at the time with the country being at war, people were probably staying at home more. Right. Um, and the war Mal was... Malnutrition. And the war, and the war was killing so many people as well. You have to think if a war wasn't going on when that broke out, and people were going about their normal lives with no government really to tell them, stay indoors, wear a mask, and all this stuff. Right. How many more the Spanish flu would have killed if that war wasn't going on? Well, I, I guess you're kind of trying to look at a glass half full thing. I mean, I'm looking at a glass half empty. How many people could have survived if they weren't all held up, worried about where they're going to get their next meal from, were able to get around work, not have the stress of the war going on, maybe you'd have had more survive. So could have went either way. I yeah. Mean, let, let's be honest. Could have been either way. So, I mean, that those are a pretty good list of the, you know, pandemic or plagues or disease that knocks out the world. So uh, what else have we got? Okay. Uh, one which statistically, again, is going to happen at some point. But again, statistically, this is going to be... Yeah, could, Mil maybe millions of years right. after could, we're could, dead. Could be two yeah. years from now. Could be a hundred million yeah. years from now. Yeah, could but be we know this is going to happen. Yeah. Could be tomorrow. Um, asteroids. Uh, there's a one in ten thousand chance for a small asteroid to hit the Earth. And by that, I don't mean. I mean asteroids, meteors, kind of like fall. I know they're not technically the same thing. You know, fall to Earth. You know, oh, all the time. All the time. Right. But this is talking about when it talks about a smaller size, it means something which maybe, you know, if it hit uh, Dallas, you know, it might wipe out half of Dallas. But that's right. not on a cataclysmic, you know, huge scale. Now, for a larger asteroid, one which could be considered a planet killer, not because of the immediate blast, but because of all the ash it throws right. up into the air. The aftermath. Yeah, the planet killers... Uh, they say there's a one in 300,000 chance at any given time it can happen, but I don't know what the gap in time is between each of those remeasurements of did it happen now? Did it happen now? Did it happen now? Because right. you can go 300,000 seconds and be like, okay, well, it's, it can happen anytime now, but if that gap is like, I don't know, 100 years or 1,000 years and it becomes a one in 300,000 chance, you know, shot. Yeah. Because the last, you know, big asteroid, um, the one that, the that wiped out the dinosaurs, yeah, right? 65 million years ago. So you take that one in 300,000 chance, right? Of being hit by a planet killer sized asteroid. And you we have haven't large, been hit yeah, with one in, in 65, 65 million. You yeah. kind of think that you can take that stats in, oh my goodness, we're overdue like any day now, or that, you know, when they play these odds of, oh, you have a one in 300,000 chance of this or that. Right. Stats like that, and you mentioned earlier about the more chance of being killed by a cow than by a shark. Right. That, yeah. and, well, and yeah. they, they also say, you know, you have, statistically you have a better yeah. chance of getting struck by lightning than winning the lottery. Yeah. But most lottery winners have never been struck by lightning. Right. So, 
you know, they, they, not to upset all the mathematicians out there, but there's certain things you've got to loosely interpret with statistical probability. Right, uh, and it's that one-size-fits-all thing, right? So if we came up with a number of people, cows killed each year, we won't say murdered. When they're not mean, I don't think. I yeah. think most of it's accidental. But, you know, if, it, if your chance know, maybe is, Maybe there's evil cows mm, out there. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. Mm. Top, top topic for a different <laughs> podcast. Yeah. The evil cows. I, yeah. I don't know. Well, it, say your chances of being killed by a cow per head of population, I don't know, was one in 8.5 million. Okay. People take that stat and they think, oh, so I've got a one in, you know, eight and a half million, eight and a half yeah. million chance of being killed by a cow. But what if you work on a farm? Those same odds don't apply. So, I mean, you can dismiss people, you know, some inner city, pe- inner city oh. people, the only time they've seen a cow is on Sesame Street. They've never seen one in real life. Their oh. chances of being killed by a cow, very, very small. So, on the flip side of that coin, if you're a surfer, your odds of getting killed by a shark are a heck of a lot better than getting killed by a cow. Because so, last yeah. time I checked, there yeah. aren't many cows on surfboards out in the ocean. Right. But there's lots of sharks swimming beneath the surfers. So. Yeah. Hey, you've got to weigh those odds. Yeah. They're, they're just spreading them across something that people can understand. But right. once again, are they trying to scare people a little bit? I mean, you, you could think about it that way. So we got one more, last but not least. And this kind of goes back to a podcast that we had a few podcasts ago. What would be one of the other end-of-the-world scenarios? Well, our very favorite one, uh, Death by AI. Oh, oh. Our robot overlords our robot strike overlords. again. Yeah. Now, like you said, we now did... will it be the police robots that no. you know commit suicide into ponds and tell women that they don't want to report their crimes and sing songs and run away, or these other kind of AI problems? Well, w- these specific problems relate to the end of the world, where I don't think those police robots, you know, were really going to trigger the end of the world. They might kind of trigger a lack of faith, you know, defund the police robots yeah. movement. That's true. But, you know, most people, when they have, when they talk about an AI dystopia, they either talk about it Terminator style with killer robots, you Some know. Militaristic style yeah. robots. Yeah. And, you know, the big kind of thought behind that, at least with people who have done some research on it, seems to be that when AI becomes sentient and understands it can take over the world and it just regards the human as a virus, that that's when, you know, the greatest chance would occur. The chance of it happening through bad coding or one robot getting a bang on the head and just goes rogue and the other, and he say he's the commander of that battalion of army robots and the rest just follow him and they just, you know, go crazy. I mean, that scenario is very unlikely. It's not going to be because of a programming error. It's the AI well, could it, could it be something like uh, the robot is out there and it decides it's time for a Windows update and the Windows update is corrupt and then all of a sudden he goes nuts because, you know, I've already had nine Windows updates today. I can't take a tenth one and then he just decides to go nuts because he can't take another Windows update. I, I'd say it's more chance of it being Adobe Acrobat because that thing has to update. Like, well, that iTunes, however many, iTunes uh, is oh, the same time. I mean, yeah. every time I open up iTunes, I yeah. have to update it, and I still right. haven't figured out what's any different behind right. it. Yeah. A- Adobe, yeah, I mean, that's another one. Or Java. Hopefully they don't use Java to write this script for these robots <laughs> because they're going to have to be updated every 45 seconds. So right. they're just going to get frustrated. Yeah. I mean, just think about all the frustration that people have when they flip out and they cause all kinds of problems. If you put software in these robots that have to be updated all the time, maybe they just have said, you know what? I've had it. I've had enough. I can't take another update. I'm just done. I'm absolutely done. Yeah. And again, I think it's one of those ways to go, which would at least be more exciting than some of the others we've mentioned. Well, it would be exciting as long as it became kind of that Terminator scenario of, you know, militaristic and we're kind of fighting back. It'd be horrible if the end of the world was based off of a Java update. But you know, but you know that neither of us would actually get to that, you know, Terminator type scenes they opened with. You know, it, it, for for yeah. you and I, would have probably been within the first two percent killed, probably by the robots. Oh, oh, absolutely. Because we'd, we'd think we could talk them out of it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. Either that, or, or yeah. we'd try to outsmart yeah. them, or fight them, or do something. We'd get wiped out, so we wouldn't get to see the 
rest of the end of the world, or as we've called it, come Armageddon, come. So. And, you can, and you can guarantee uh, one of us would actually ask uh, the Terminators to come in and do a podcast before they went out on their that carnage. Might be, that might be interesting. <laughs> you know, you're, you're sitting there and you ask yeah. them, so uh, <laughs> you had this last Java update and you decided to take over the world. Uh, you know, thanks, thanks for coming on our show and yeah. letting us have this yeah. one last podcast that nobody's going to listen to because we're going to forget to upload it. So right, nobody's yeah. going to be able to listen to it. Yeah. I mean, how terrible is that going right. to be? Well, with that said, thanks for tuning into this episode of The Wolf and the Shepherd. We hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for all the support you all have shown us. Please continue to support us and, and share our program, and we'll talk to you next time.